going to pick back up on talking about being spiritual and the concept of spirituality. Remember, spiritual is used to describe one who is filled by the Holy Spirit and therefore emanates the things of the Spirit. We see in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18 where it does state that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and that filling is the filling up where we're lacking, because he then is able to produce in our lives uh, the fruit of the Spirit, or that would be his fruit, and that would be the character of Christ. As we were going through this last week, we were talking about the uh, different parts of the human nature, because those are very important to understand in regards to being spiritual, because we have a body, soul, and a spirit. Now, we can function from our soul, or we can function from our spirit. Our soul is our emotional center. Our spirit is our rational center. Now, the natural or soulish man, we also looked at that last week, <clears throat> or the week before. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the, the natural or soulish man is a man that's unsaved. And this is the person who only functions from their soul. They do not function from their emotions. Now, that's not to say that they cannot be rational, because even unsaved humans still have a spirit, and they can be rational. And those who are rational can actually be used by Satan, to where he will sow them among the saints as tares. So he'll use those, but they're still unsaved people. And we are looking at the categories of Christians. So these would be the different types of Christians. We have two primary categories. You can be carnal or you can be spiritual. Uh, those are the two areas in which a Christian can function within their life. Now, if you're carnal, that means you're emanating the things of the flesh. You're seeking out the desires of the flesh and to fulfill those desires. When you're in that state, you cannot please God. You're not going, as a matter of fact, spiritual things aren't going to make sense to you. That does not mean you are not going to be a religious person, this is because one of the works of the flesh is what? Religious superstitious awe. It's religion. Okay, so, so a flesh, a, a carnal Christian can appear to be very religious, especially in their duties and stuff like that, but they're still carnal. They're not growing. They're not able to mature in their understanding of the Christian life. And therefore, really, when it comes to uh, the details of the Christian life, they become inarticulate babblers. Like how to have victory over your enemies. I mean, in this course, we will go over the armor of God in detail. It is amazing how bad some of the commentaries are on the armor of God. You know, they, they don't make any sense at all because they're not paying attention to what Scripture is saying. Not to mention how many are how many commentaries actually talk about our sin nature. What is our sin nature? That that part of us that always wants to do those things that are wrong. We want to do what's right, but we always have a part of us pulling towards doing things that are wrong. How do we overcome that? Well, somebody who's carnal is not going to learn and mature and grow, and they're not going to be able to share that with other people. So now under the category of a carnal Christian, there are several areas that a Christian can fall into. Of course, you can just simply be carnal, which means you are manifesting an aspect of the, or a work of the flesh. That, you know, one of the works of the flesh, which are described over in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, you will be manifesting one of those. And that would be a carnal person. You know, a carnal Christian can also be ensnared. We looked at that last week. And one who is ensnared, they are doing Satan's will, thinking that it is God's will. And typically, where this will be, and where you can spot this, is when God specifically says, do not do something. It is his desire's will for you not to be involved in something. And a person is justifying their involvement in that. God doesn't change his mind. He doesn't say, well, I'll make an exception in this case. doesn't work that way with this desire as well. Then we have those who are Galatianites. A Galatianite, a carnal uh, Christian, who is caught up in trying to show other people their righteousness through their works. 
And, and a lot of times we will see this manifested, well, especially, by the way, in regards to the salvation, where you get people who say, well, if your works do not show, if you don't, if your life doesn't show good works, then you're not saved. But that's completely contrary to scripture. And you get those people where basically you have uh, groups of people who are trying to justify their their salvation by their works rather than living out who they are in Christ. Okay, that's a Galatianite. That's somebody who's trying to, who, and typically it's under law, and not necessarily the Mosaic law, inequality of law. Last week, uh, I did. We stopped right about the uh, lover of the present evil age. Um, I've kind of mentioned it a little bit, but we'll go over it in a little bit more detail. So this is over in 2 Timothy, where Paul talks about this. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, where we have Demas. He's using this as a, um, Demas as an example here. Demas abandoned him, having a love for this age, and traveled to Thessalonica. So here it says, for Demas has forsaken me and having loved this present. Uh, now, actually, our translations say world, but it's actually your word age. And we were talking about that a little bit last week also, because an age is a course or a period of time in which God is showing something to intelligent beings about himself. Satan has an age for the world. That means that's the course that he wants the world to, to go by, to function in. So this is the present evil age. And one who loves the present evil age is one who loves debating. Debating is the wisdom that comes from this particular world system that we're in and this age. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20 talks about this. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer or debater of this age? Has not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? Now, and we were talking about this previously, you should be able to give an argument, a good defense why you believe what you believe. You absolutely should. You know, you should be able to learn. Now, I'm not saying you need to do it eloquently. You might slaughter the words, but still be able to give a proper defense. That is not the same as debating each person. Debating what is the actual intent of debate. It is to persuade someone to your point of view. It has nothing to actually do with truth. Okay. We like to think of it as truth, but that's not really, if you listen to debates, especially during this time of the year, you listen to debates. What's the point of the debate? To get you to persuade you to vote for this person over to their way of thinking. That's world system stuff. Then we have the conformer to the legal age. This is over in Romans. And Romans chapter 12 and verse uh, 2 is technically where it starts. Uh, in the context, though, we want to pull the whole thing here. So in starting in verse 1, because he says, I encourage you, therefore, brethren, by the compassions. He does not use the word mercy here. He uses the word compassions. By the compassions of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And that's technically your reasonable religious service. It's a very specific word for that. And to stop being conformed, this is putting on a mask for this of this age. Doesn't you now again they translate it. Some translations will actually translate it as world. Others will do it as age. It is should be age. Okay, and the context is talking about the legal age. So this is masquer the one who masquerades as though they are under law. This is a person who is trying to show their righteousness to God through their work. That's what this, now there's a difference between a Galatianite and one who is of the, of a, well, what are they? They're ones who are a conformer to the legal age or putting on a mask to the legal age. The Galatianite is focusing on looking righteous before men. 
the conformer to the legal age is the one who is looking for uh, to show his righteousness to God through his action. So a slightly different way. Both of those are carnal, by the way. They're a carnal Christian who is masquerading like somebody who is under the Mosaic law. And this would be more of a focus on the Mosaic law, where a Galatianite could be focused on any law. Then you also have somebody who is a lover of the world system. First John talks about this. First John chapter uh, 2 and verse 15. First John 2, 15, it says, and stop loving the world and the things in the world. Or literally, do not. Um, the do not here is stop. So it says, do not love the world nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world. Now, it is important to note here, instead of do not stop, because this, the concept of understanding is he's actually expressing stop means there are some Christians in the group that are doing this. And these are carnal Christians. They're expressing love. They're expressing agape type of love towards the world system. Now, what happens here is a Christian, they're spiritual, they're expressing love towards other saints. And that love begins to get misdirected towards the world. Did God tell us to love the whole world? There's no place in Scripture where it actually says God told us to love the whole world. Now, if you misconstrue the concept of John chapter 13, verse 34, with one another to mean everybody, which it in the context it can't, the actual word itself cannot actually mean everybody, then you can try to imply it from that, but that's only implying it. He very clearly said we are to love other Christians, and that's just what our focus to be. When it comes to the world, if anyone is loving the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So if you're expressing love towards the world, now how could we express love towards the world as, as a in church? There's one of the most predominant ways we see this today is what you would refer to as community events where the resources for the saints are being taken and given to unbelievers. You know, and we're not talking about meeting an actual need. We're talking about really trying to, to bribe them to come in. And oh yeah, it gets out to what I would refer to as outright bribery. It wasn't but a few years ago that we got a flyer in the mail that if you brought your child to a church here in Snohomish, close by, if you brought them on Easter, they would get an iPad for free. It, it was shocking. I, was, I had to read it a couple of times. Like, seriously? Bribery. You know, but I bet if you go to that assembly, they're not taking care of their own. Their own are struggling. I've seen that many times in assemblies where of food pantries and stuff like that. They'll give food to unbelievers, but they won't actually support their own. They won't provide for them. And again, I'm not talking about letting somebody be lazy. I mean, somebody actually needs assistance. They're not caring for them. They're misdirecting their love. Food kitchens and stuff like that, where they're bringing in the poor and they're just feeding the poor, but they're really, the only thing they're doing is is helping them down that path of corruption because they're being lazy and they don't want to work. Why would you? Yeah. We don't express love towards the world. The, word, the, the Father, the love of the Father is not in a person who expresses love towards the world, which means you're carnal when you start doing that. For all that is in the world, the lust of the, of the uh, flesh, and remember your word lust here just means strong desires, the strong desires of the flesh, the strong desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. And this particular word, life, is bios, which means biological life. This is where the concept of race comes from. And what I mean by race is race based upon a person's color, the color of their skin. That's a world system thing. There are different races in this world. There are three of them. 
scripturally there are three of them. There are the Gentiles, there are the Jews, and there's the Church of God. Those are the only three. Color, family, location on the earth has nothing to do with, with anything. But the world system really wants to make it, wants to emphasize that. You know, especially, especially now today, they really want to emphasize the color of your skin as though you're from a different race. But it doesn't, that's not, a, literally, if you're saying a person is from a different race, you're saying they have a different source. So that would mean that, well, if you go back to evolution, you see where evolution is coming out of this, this concept into it? Because, well, they, they evolved from a different animal. Now, that's going to run into some issues because, you know, our blood and other stuff like that are interchangeable, which means we have to have had the same source. We could not have a, a different source. You know, world system stuff. That is a carnal Christian who's loving that, a carnal Christian that is, they're going to love the world. They're going to put the world above other Christians. And typically it will be through giving what should be uh, for the saints. They're giving that to unbelievers. And they're typically giving it to unbelievers, very, very unthankful unbelievers. I've seen so many where they come and demand stuff from the church. Now, should we do community events as a church? In most cases, I would say likely not. But there are some cases where we can help out. We can help our community out because we are actually to do good for the community. So if we can get involved in a particular community event that actually benefits, benefits us, benefits the community, that's a little bit better. But not one that makes a person feel good because they went out and they fed the poor. Or they cleaned up the street that the government is paid to clean up. Stuff like that. You know, that's not beneficial. Um, that's just to make people feel good. These are your carnal Christians. We don't want to be in that classification of Christians. The other area, which is where we should be, is being spiritual. Spiritual means to pertain to or emanate the things of the Spirit. Now, this would be the Holy Spirit. So we're pertaining to or emanating the things related to the Holy Spirit. When a Christian is seeking out and fulfilling the desires of the Holy Spirit, he is in a spiritual state. So it's not just I'm thinking spiritual things, but I'm seeking out and fulfilling the desires from the Spirit. I'm manifesting, I'm emanating those things. There is only one degree of spirituality, although there are varying degrees of maturity, because we will vary in maturity and how we understand how to apply the Christian life. If one, if there is no degrees of spirituality, we're all, if we're spiritual, we're all spiritual at the same level, okay, which we all have the same potential. When a Christian is spiritual, he is able to mature through the Holy Spirit, comparing spiritual concepts with spiritual words. And we see that over in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13, where Scripture is talking about that. And it says, these things we speak also not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So it's actually, it's, it's neuter and... and uh, Masculine, so it's spiritual things with spiritual words in the context there. The Holy Spirit puts things together for us. He takes, you know, Scripture is very interesting how it is written. Um, it is written in such a way where we get a little bit of information from one book, and from another book, we get kind of the, the fills in some more information. And then from another one, it fills in a little bit more information. The Holy Spirit puts that together. You know, as we go through the how to, especially in relation to how to have victory over our sin nature, you know that Jesus, he drops that truth very early on. And people use that today and don't even understand what they're saying. When, when you say, and the truth will set you free, Jesus is talking about doctrine that's coming by which if you apply it, you will have victory over the sin nature. Pretty incredible. But you don't actually learn the details until you get into 
Romans. Then you get Romans chapter 6, you get the detail. And then Galatians, you get a little bit more detail about how the Holy Spirit contradicts. His desires are contrary to the flesh so that you can't actually produce, you can't do what you want. So he, the Holy Spirit is the one who puts these things together. And he is also the one who teaches us how to abide in Christ. So you see this over in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27. Now, 1 John 2, 27 says, But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone should teach you. But as the, the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it was taught you, you abide in him. There's a lot in that verse. Number one, in the context, especially in Scripture, the concept of anointing does refer to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit being one who is indwelling us. We have received the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit abides in us. It is using a specific word for abiding here that means to settle down and feel at ease. So we are his residents at this point. Now, because of that, we do not need anybody to teach us, but we don't need anybody to teach us what? It, this is where it's important uh, when in Scripture to take the context. This does not mean you don't need to go to church. It doesn't mean you don't need a pastor. It doesn't mean, it doesn't, it's not saying you shouldn't go to school. It, it explains it in the context. As you drop down to the last part of the sentence here, and just as he has taught you, you abide in him. The Holy Spirit teaches us how to abide in Christ, feel at ease with who we are in Christ. As a pastor, and, and God actually gave, more specifically Christ, gave to the church gifts, pastors, even teachers. And, and those are the same person, by the way. The pastor-teacher is the same that he's talking about there in, over in Ephesians. Same person. For the intent of bringing the saints to a oneness of the faith. So as a pastor, I can teach you doctrine, but it's the Holy Spirit that's going to teach you how to apply that in your situation, in the situation you face. He's the one who actually teaches us these things. So when we're spiritual, we're going to start understanding spiritual things. We're going to start looking at our situation properly, and the Holy Spirit's going to put things together proper, correctly for us so that we can actually continue to feel at ease with who we are in Christ. And remain, remain ones who are spiritual. In this state of mind, the saint, the saint will be able to discern the things of God that relate to what he uh, has prepared for those who love him. Now we see this back over in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15. Not 15, I think, but it's right in that area. Is it that, uh, did I put that in my notes in 15? I should have put, I should have gone back up. I think I put 215. Um, no, it should have been uh, in 12. So correct that in the notes, because that should actually be 12. It says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of, uh, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. We might actually know these things. Okay. These things we don't speak, and then he goes on to talking about, we don't speak these by the wisdom of men, but by the actual uh, teaching of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual, well, actually, before I get into that, a person that is, uh, that is spiritual is filled with where they are lacking by the Holy Spirit. And that's, uh, we were talking about that earlier. Let's go over to Ephesians where you'll see that. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. Where here it says, uh, stop being drunk with wine in which is no savingness, but be filled. And this particular word is, I've, I've hit on this many times. And it's important to understand because Greek has a couple of different ways to describe filling. This is a filling up where you are lacking. You cannot, none of us, 
have the ability to produce within ourselves a quality of character that matches God's quality of character. It's not, it's, it's impossible for us to do that. Yet, we can actually manifest a quality of the character of Christ. The Holy Spirit's the one who has to make that possible. So he's the one who makes it so that we can love saints properly. We have long suffering of the fruit of the Spirit. That's uh, very specifically where it's at, and that's over in Galatians. This is the kind of character that we can actually manifest because we're spiritual. Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, oh, by the way here, this is not fruits. It's fruit. It's singular. Most of the time, you'll see this represented as a cluster of grapes or something like that. That's not actually a very good way of describing this. Probably a better way to describe this would be to take an orange and cut it in half. So you have the membrane going through each of the different parts of the fruit. Well, what part of the fruit of the spirit is that? Love. Love is going to be used with almost every other aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. So with joy, there's going to be an element of and an expression of love along with it. The same thing with peace. So, And then each section is a part of the fruit. Now, some sections we combine together. We use them at the same time. You can use joy and peace at the same time. Love, joy, and peace. You can express those at the same time. So it's all, it all talks about the character of Christ. So it, it relates specifically to him. But there's parts of manifesting as we live out righteousness in our lives, we're going to express it in different ways. Maybe loving towards other saints. It may be being content in any situation, joy, peace, not being uh, ruffled, not having a ruffled mind, long-suffering, holding out our anger against unreasonable people. Typically, love will be, uh, actually, typically, love will lead that one. It won't just be in the mix. It'll actually be leading it. Okay. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Now, I'm going to correct a few things. Gentleness is not a, a part of the fruit of the Spirit. It has nothing to do with the fruit of the Spirit. This particular word that they translate as gentleness means objectivity of mind. And it's very important. This is a good study, by the way. If you go and you just look up this particular word, you'll find they translate it so many different ways. And there's ways where they translate it with the actual word for gentleness. Um, let me see if I can find that really quick, because uh, it depends on the translation you have, but they've done this a few times. Um, first, Corin 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1. You actually have the correct word for gentleness in here. And what do they do? They switch the word that they just translated as gentleness in Galatians. They switch it to meekness. That's what they do. They're changing the name or changing the definition. Excuse me. Here it says, now I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the, uh, now they're translating it meekness and gentleness of Christ. Well, you know, translations don't work that way. You need to be consistent with the way you're translating words, you know, and they're not being consistent. And as we dig in, like I said, when you, when you dig into this word, you find out that this particular word means an objectivity of mind. You are focused on the goal, and it doesn't matter what is going on around you. That's actually really important when it comes to persecution. Why would you consider, or even, um, I mean, if you think about persecution, the intent is to get you to stop doing what you're doing because they don't like it. Okay. Why would you continue and force your way through? Because you have a focus. No, this is who I am. And it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. This is who I am in Christ. Self-control. Now you'll notice against such, there is no law. This is again, one of those really strong areas where it shows us that we as Christians cannot function by law. It's not possible. And by law means don't put a do not on yourself. Now, there are some do nots. 
Okay, in the sense of there are things that for Christians should not be involved in. But if you run across one of those things, what should your focus be? What should I be doing? The do part, not the do not. What am I supposed to be doing? How do I apply that? And then the fruit of the Spirit would, of course, manifest out of that. So back over in 1 Corinthians, as he goes on with talking about being spiritual, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse now in verse 15, that was the correct one there. But he who is spiritual judges, now your particular word judge here um, actually means to discern. So this is how you're judging, is you're discerning. So he discerns all things. And of course, the all things in the context would be referring to the things of God. So all things, yet he himself is uh, discerned by no one. And I, we have talked about this before, and, it's, and it is one of the things that's worth coming back in and readdressing. You cannot look at a person and determine whether they are spiritual. Now, people will try to give an appearance of being spiritual, especially if they're carnal. They will very much try to give an appearance of it. They have to do something. You have to see some fruit. And that's what it's talking about here. But the one who is spiritual will be able to discern things. So obviously, a spiritual Christian is one who is spiritual. They're manifesting the things of the Spirit. They're emanating the things of the Spirit. They're paying attention to the desires from the Holy Spirit. They're seeking to fulfill His desires, and they're governing their life by the Holy Spirit. That is literally being led by the Spirit. Galatians talks about this. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, which is literally since you are led by the Spirit, you are not under any law. You don't need law to govern your life. As a matter of fact, the only thing law does is bring us into bondage. Now, this is also in the context here where it shows how the Holy Spirit overtakes the desires from the flesh. Because his desires are contrary to the desires of the flesh. And when we start paying attention to his desires, you know what happens to those desires from the flesh? They actually start to diminish. Now, at first, that can be very difficult because if you're caught in a, in a, you know, in a trespass or you're caught in a temptation, let's go to the temptation first. What good is a temptation if it's not really a, something to tempt you by that you're not struggling with? It can be very intense. You really want to do that, but you know you're not supposed to do that, but you really want to be involved with that. Otherwise, it's not really a temptation. So it can be very strong and intense. Being obedient to God's word at that point, which as we get to through um, when we're talking about the sin nature, as you apply the truth, which is no reckoning yield, know that you have died with Christ and been raised to walk in newness of life, count that to be true, and then start yielding your members to righteousness. You keep focusing on that. The, the desire from the Holy Spirit will overcome those desires from the flesh. And every single time, it will overcome them to the point to where not too far in the distant future from having that struggle, you're going to look back on it and say, why, why was I even struggling with that at that time? Because the Holy Spirit's desires are now stronger in you. And the, and the sin nature brings you up and you're like, I am just not interested in that. It's no longer a temptation. Because you applied scripture. Now, a spiritual Christian can then also be one or should also be one who is maturing. So as you're spiritual, the natural result of being spiritual is going, you're going to start maturing. A, a maturing Christian, we see uh, an example of this over in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14. And by the way, a, a maturing Christian has nothing to do with your age. I have seen young, and I'm talking teenage young, and even younger, to be honest with you, uh, children who can articulate God's word better than 70, 80-year-old men who have been Christians all their lives. Maturity has to do with you 
focusing on the desires from the spirit and beginning to use the things related to salvation so that you train your senses to discern the difference between what is wrong, uh, right and wrong. And this is where it's talking about here in, in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter five and verse 14. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. Then uh, your word full age there would just be mature. That is those who by reason or through reason have their senses uh, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And your word good here is kakos, which would be that which is wrong. And evil is, or let me get, I jumped ahead of myself on that one. Uh, kalos is your word good, and kalos means proper. Kakos is your word for evil here, and kakos means wrong, that which lacks in character. That kind of a wrong thing. So, one who is maturing is going to start being able to understand the, the more solid things of doctrine in Scripture. Solid food is for them. We also see over in 1 Corinthians where Paul talks about this. The one who is maturing, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden mystery, or the hidden one, which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, nor had they known, or had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. This was actually the verse I wanted earlier. So it was, uh, um, don't stop there. Read the next verse. What does the next verse say? But God has revealed them to us. We understand these things we can understand them. the things that god has prepared for those who love us to who love him he's talking about the church and, and what we have a pretty incredible stuff that we is in, in so so it is a wisdom that relates to uh, wisdom does relate to maturity it is not a wisdom of this age so a maturing christian is spiritual and through practice is training their senses to know God's will in any situation, and therefore gaining experiential knowledge of their position in Christ and uh, their possessions in salvation by living them out. They're using them, using what God has actually uh, applied to us. So. I did have... The next set of notes, I did pass that out, which has to do with dealing with sin in our lives. And I'm kind of torn on whether I want to get into this or not, because I don't I don't really have a lot of a lot of time specifically less for this, because I do want to open it up to uh, questions if anybody has any. So, yeah, I'll save the dealing with uh, sin in our lives um, for next week. Because, unfortunately, when we're carnal, we will produce sin. And then we got to deal with it. How do we deal with sin in our life? 